Today I'm speaking with Roland Griffiths. Roland is a professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Neurosciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His principal research focus in both clinical and preclinical laboratories has been on the behavioral and subjective effects of mood-altering drugs. He is the author of over 380 journal articles and book chapters, and has trained more than 50 postdoctoral research fellows. He has been a consultant to the National Institutes of Health, to numerous pharmaceutical companies in the development of new psychotropic drugs, and as a member of the Expert Advisory Panel on Drug Dependence for the World Health Organization. He's conducted extensive research with sedative hypnotics, caffeine, and other drugs. And in 1999, he initiated a research program investigating the effects of the classic psychedelic psilocybin that included studies in healthy volunteers, in beginning and long-term meditators, and in religious leaders. And much of the resurgence in psychedelic research is certainly due to him and the work he's been spearheading at Johns Hopkins, as you'll hear. And Roland and I cover a lot of ground here with respect to the current state of research on psychedelics. We discuss the history of prohibition against their use, the clinical and scientific promise of psilocybin and mescaline and LSD and DMT and MDMA and other compounds. We talk about the risks associated with these drugs, the role of set and setting in determining a person's experience. We talk about bad trips, the difference between psychedelics and drugs of abuse, MDMA and neurotoxicity, and we talk about the experiences people have, experiences of unity and sacredness and love and apprehensions of truth. We talk about the long-term consequences of psychedelic experience, synthetic versus natural compounds, the prospects of devising new drugs, microdosing, the research being done on psilocybin and long-term meditators, the experience of encountering other apparent beings while on these drugs, psilocybin treatment for addiction, and other topics. And in my afterword, I discuss the first psychedelic experience I've had in 25 years. I actually took a large dose of psilocybin about a week after I recorded this conversation with Roland. So this is an unusual addendum. And while I had planned to uh, do this for quite some time, you will notice that the timing of my conversation with Roland was certainly auspicious. And now, without further delay, I bring you Roland Griffiths. I am here with Roland Griffiths. Roland, thanks for joining me. Pleased to join you, Sam. Well, this is great. You know, I've been wanting to talk to a scientist who has seized the moment, which seems to come around once every other generation to study psychedelics. And, you know, you are, I think, the most prominent person in the field at the moment. So it's really an, an honor to get you here. Let's just talk for a moment about your scientific background and the work you're doing at Johns Hopkins and, and just set the, set the stage for this conversation. Well, Sam, first of all, let me just say, I'm just delighted to join you. I'm uh, a, a fan of your podcast, found it very interesting. And there's such a convergence, I feel, of my interests in this whole area and some of yours that I'm excited to talk about it. Nice. So let's see, with respect to my background, I'm trained in psychopharmacology, pharmacology, and experimental psychology. I came to Hopkins in 19, in the early 1970s and have been focusing on research on psychoactive drugs, primarily drugs of abuse. And so much of my early career, both in animal research and human research, was focusing on various mood-altering psychoactive drugs, primarily those for which drug dependence is, a, is an issue and a problem. And about 25 years ago, I started a meditation practice. I'd been interested in meditation for a long time, had tried it in graduate school and found that it was extraordinarily difficult. Three minutes felt like three hours, and I was a pretty rapid uh, dropout. But 
about 25 years ago, I got reintroduced. I don't know what was different, but it was different. And all of a sudden there was kind of a depth of experience that was just truly intriguing to me. I might say that my original training was in experimental analysis of behavior, Skinnerian psychology, if you will, that tends to discount the importance of subjective experience. Mm -hmm. But despite that, I, I thought just the basic methodology of meditation and approach appealed to me because I certainly had this strong sense that there was, there was something to know about this kind of internal sense of subjectivity or whatever that was. And although the explanations that were given by the people in, in meditation didn't correspond in any sense to the f neurophysiology or biology I was learning, I was able to kind of discount that and take it as metaphor because, uh, you know, clearly these procedures had been developed over thousands of years. And I thought to myself, surely there, there must be something of value. And if I can treat it as metaphor, what can I learn? And mm. so that was my, that's how I kind of reconciled my scientific materialism worldview with what it was to, you know, learn about subjectivity. What I did have as I got involved with meditation is significant and salient experiences that got me deeply intrigued about the nature of these kinds of experiences and what the implications were and, and whether or not that should change some of my own priorities, well, how, how I'm spending mm. my time. And so there was actually a period of time after that, that I really contemplated dropping out of science, going off to India, as you did <laughs> for a period of time, going off and, uh, and just enmeshing myself in this world of meditation and internal inquiry. So what year was it that you uh, first got exposed to meditation? Let's see, I think it was 1993. 93. So yeah, so um, at the time you said you were, uh, you considered going to India. What made that door uh, not open for you? Well, I had this great job. People, <laughs> I, I had uh, respect and a mm -hmm. job. I had employees here at Hopkins. If I had walked away from it, I would have dropped a lot of responsibilities. I would have left a lot of people in the lurch. And you know, perhaps I just wasn't quite ready to make that radical uh, change, walk away from my entire life life situation. But you were getting into your graduate work in the 60s, you said. And, mm -hmm. so, and so this was after, I assume this was after um, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert were fired from Harvard and, yes. and, the, and the stigma around studying psychedelics had already come crashing down. Yes. But at that point, you were not yet into meditation, right? So you, would you have been a candidate for somebody as someone who would have wanted to study? those compounds or it just wasn't on your radar at all let's see how could one not have been curious about that mm. i mean so no i i think i i would have been curious but because it wasn't a viable option and i yeah. didn't run in crowds that were deeply impressed with the effects of psychedelics it just wasn't a particularly important option for me to to track and then very early on, I ended up through good fortune making connection with several different people that really prompted me to think about psychedelics and kind of reintroduced me to the older literature on psychedelics, with which I was kind of vaguely familiar. But even when I went off to graduate school in the late 60s, psychedelics as an area of research had just been pulled off the board. And in fact, it mm. was a third rail for people who 
were interested in developing careers in psychopharmacology or pharmacology, if you expressed interest in that, it uh, marginalized you in, in a way that wasn't professionally helpful. So I never really gave it any thought until, until I had some of these experiences, started rereading that literature, and then becoming really intrigued about whether or not the kinds of experiences that were being described really happened. And I have to say, I went into this as a, as a real skeptic. I was delighted with my meditation practice. I was doing that exploration, but I also was a full professor at Hopkins with an international reputation in clinical pharmacology and so thought, if anyone had a shot at getting a study approved through not only my IRB, but FDA and DEA, you know, I would have a reasonable shot at doing so. And so through funding in part provided from a group called the Council on Spiritual Practices in California with Bob Jesse as leader there, and in part through reallocating funding from a grant I had from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, we undertook a study of psilocybin in healthy volunteers who had never before experienced a psychedelic. Mm. And we did the study with a positive control. It was a high dose of methylphenidate, that's Ritalin, that has an onset and a duration of action pretty similar to psilocybin. And because it's a stimulant that produces uh, mood elevating effects, and because these people were naive to the effects of psychedelics, we thought it was a plausible positive mm -hmm. control. This is a better control than was used in the famous Good Friday experiment at Harvard, where I think it was psilocybin they were given, and, and then I think they were given a, a placebo. And the difference between psilocybin and placebo is apparently fairly stark. It, <laughs> it's very stark. They gave uh, niacin, I believe. Oh, they did? Okay. But, yeah. but nonetheless, it's stark. I mean, that just right. produces some local flushing. And it's, it's actually a deep problem in studying psychedelics because the very nature of their experience is to <laughs> produce radical changes in the nature of subjective experience. So blinding is deeply embedded in this area as a, as a methodological problem. But mm -hmm. we, we also bent over backwards. We gave people instructions that were misleading with respect to the, all the drug conditions that could be administered. They were told that they could receive up to, I think it was 13 different psychoactive compounds. They were told they'd have two or three sessions at least one of which would include a moderately high dose of psilocybin. But in fact, all we were comparing is methylphenidate and psilocybin under conditions that blurred those, those effects. And some people got two doses of methylphenidate and only subsequently got psilocybin. And then the other kind of tricky thing we did is we kept our guide staff, their clinical staff, completely blind to the design. So they didn't know the design either. Mm -hmm. And under those conditions, it was remarkable that, well, what wasn't remarkable is when you give, oh, let, well, let me just describe this, the setup. So the setup, which is really built on work that was done in the 50s and 60s to presumably optimize psychedelic experiences for meaningful effects is one in which rapport and trust is developed with the volunteer through about eight hours of contact prior to the first session. And then sessions are comprised of coming in to a living room-like environment. The volunteer is with two people with whom he or she has spent eight hours reviewing kind of life, life situation. They come in, they have a low fat breakfast. Uh, 
They take a capsule. We give psilocybin in the form of a capsule, although psilocybin is the active ingredient in the magic mushroom. This is synthesized psilocybin. They take a capsule and we ask them to lay on a couch, use eye shades and headphones through which they listen to a program of music. And the instruction is to pay attention to your inner experience. This is not a therapeutic talk guided mm -hmm. session per se. This is an opportunity to, we would say, explore the nature of mind as it comes forth. And so that's the basic setup. Not surprisingly, what happens is what we would have expected to happen based on everything we know about psychedelics. There are changes in visual perceptual phenomena, kind of illusions. There's changes in emotionality, both positive and negative, fearful, changes in cognitive processes. But what was of interest to me, having gotten interested in meditation and spiritual experience, was the extent to which these experiences read out as similar to mystical type experiences that have been reported by mystics and religious figures throughout the ages. And as, as you mentioned, there was a very nice study done at Harvard back in the 1960s that seemed to show that psilocybin given to seminary students produced some of these kinds of effects, that although the methodology of that study lacked a number of features that we were able to yeah. correct for. I mean, it was a group study. and It might be that the uh, investigators were using their own supply of psilocybin. Well, they did. Uh, yeah. So, the, yeah, yeah the, <laughs> they, they were dosing right along with the volunteers, and the, and the whole thing was done as a group. And so it was not as methodologically tight as, as what we would have expected today. That's one approach to blinding that you can take. Just uh, take the drug along with everybody, then you lose track of who's in which condition. <laughs> so I, I want to get into discussing the these various compounds and the clinical applications and the and their different spectrum of effects. But before we do, I just want to give a a plug for the center that you're currently running at Johns Hopkins, and if you can just describe what's happening there. And I should say that you, you and I were put together by my friend Tim Ferriss, who I think has recently put his shoulder to the wheel in helping to raise money for, for your center. And, and he, Tim is a, um, has found psychedelics to be incredibly helpful to him of late, and I'm very grateful for him for, for putting us together. So. Yeah, and, and we're grateful to him and a number of the other philanthropists, including the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation, for funding what amounts to the first Center for Psychedelic Studies. It's actually called the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research to be established in the United States. And uh, we're deeply grateful for the support that amounted to $17 million for us to extend and expand our program. So we have been doing research now with psychedelics that started with that first study I mentioned comparing psilocybin and methylphenidate, and that started in about 2000. So we've been at this for 20 years, but there's been virtually no funding or just very little funding at the federal level for this kind of uh, research. So it's all been philanthropic, and we've just been doing it with uh, nickels and dimes and bootlegging time and goodwill, you know, from other kinds of projects to support this. And so this establishment of the center really allows us to put our shoulders to the wheel. And I'm grateful to have a whole set of very competent colleagues here at Johns Hopkins, Matt Johnson and Fred Barrett and Albert Garcia Romeo and Natalie Lucason, all of whom are deeply interested in this area and with the funding of this, we can devote full-time effort to these projects. And what we're envisioning is that funding 
at the federal level will be forthcoming. It's still going to take a little bit of time, but the results that we're seeing are just so promising on any number of domains, be it therapeutic or neuroscience, that I think that federal agencies, NIH in particular, will will have to get into the game. I think the development of the center and contributions made by Tim Ferriss have been integral in terms of making that happen. Nice, nice. So I guess I, I want to say a few more words about the context that you're, you're working in. We, we've been alluding to this, but we really have lost a full generation, if not a, a generation and a half of research on these compounds because of the backlash that occurred against their you know, fairly indiscriminate use in the 60s. Um, and what happened is there were thousands of papers being written in the, I guess, the 40s and the 50s mm -hmm. and, and early 60s on the effects of LSD and mescaline and psilocybin and, and their clinical promise and their promise for psychopharmacology. And then the 60s happened, and that was, to some degree, engineered by Timothy Leary and, and, and Richard Albert's attitude toward essentially putting this stuff in the water, which, you know, Given how transformative these drugs have been for so many people, the temptation is understandable. It did seem like a sacrament had been discovered that could cure society of all of its ills. At least I mean, you could well imagine it seemed that way from the perspective of people who were being who were finding these drugs so transformative. And so there was, you know, very little discipline around keeping these drugs merely within research channels. And then we sort of know what we uh, we we can see the effects with everyone uh, you know growing their hair long and painting flowers on their faces and dancing in the streets and so the backlash against all of that put these drugs on you know schedule one and it became illegal to do research with them and Roland when did the total prohibition begin to lift so. The total prohibition began to lift with some early studies done by Rick Straussman, who gave DMT, dimethyltryptamine, right. which is chemically related to psilocybin. It's one of the active ingredients in ayahuasca, which is used in South America. And he got permission to give DMT to people who had previously used DMT. And he did that in the early. 90s. Our mm. approval was the first that FDA granted to give a, a reasonably high dose of a psychedelic to people who had never before used a, a psychedelic. And so that we considered to be important step and actually a breakthrough because if you're going to really evaluate the effects of these drugs, you can't introduce a selection bias of those people who have tried and and want to try again, right? You have right. skewed the population uh, mightily. And so we got our approval back in 2000. But y you're right, you know, it's, a, it's actually a very interesting story that these drugs became unavailable functionally for any human research for a period of decades. And I just wonder, you know, in the history of modern science, what analogies of that sort have occurred? You know, where has an area of really promising and interesting research been halted in its tracks with a prohibition to stop entirely? You know, maybe chemical warfare or germ warfare, but very possibly not. Mm. So it's actually very interesting, I think, from a history of science point of view, and it actually may speak precisely to the power of these compounds and their effects and their potential ability to destabilize existing cultural institutions. Because if, if you actually think back, I mean, these drugs, psilocybin and mescaline and DMT have been used very possibly for thousands of, of years. But usually they're used in cultural contexts that are ritualized and control their use 
in a very structured manner, often for re religious or divinatory or healing purposes. And so it could be that, that, yeah, if you let these compounds out into culture at large, they can destabilize cultural institutions. And, and that may be a part of what happened in the 1960s. So, you know, in addition to the antics of Timothy Leary and his, you know, advocacy for widespread use, you know, it interacted with an anti-establishment, anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. You know, Nixon is reported to have declared Timothy Leary at one point the most dangerous man in, in America. And so there was a, a weird convergence, you know, politically in terms of funding, in terms of legal structure that just wiped out research. And then interestingly, that reached into the academic institutions and, and they bought into that. There was such a, a media frenzy that emphasized the potential risks of these compounds. And there really are risks. And I certainly wouldn't want anyone to, to misunderstand that, but there, and there really are risks, but they're, they certainly are not at the level that no human research should be done with them. Yeah, well, let's hit that point of disclaimer up front. So we're going to talk about kind of two aspects of this. I mean, they're the clinical applications for addiction and depression and PTSD and end-of-life anxiety. And there's also just the, the fact that these drugs, as you say, many of them have millennia of usage for the betterment of already well people, right? So mm -hmm. it's not just a matter of treating clinical issues, but we should acknowledge that not everyone should take psychedelics and there are conditions under which it is unwise to take them. And there's a, a lot to talk about with respect to the, the set and the setting in which one uses these drugs and you know, how to use them safely. And I want to talk about the prospect that any one of these compounds could be physically toxic. I think that the data are not perhaps perfectly clear there, but they suggest that the problem of danger here is not so much a matter of physical toxicity, but the potential that someone could have a very bad experience on one or another of these drugs, and that that is just psychologically destabilizing. And you know, obviously, if you're not in a physical setting where, you know, you are looked over by somebody who is not on the drug with you, or maybe there's, there's the prospect that you can wander out of your house or, you know, out into nature and do something dangerous and stupid. So, you know, feel free to sound a note of caution here, Roland, and, and then, well, then we'll begin talking about the different compounds and how they may be different physically and, and psychologically. Yeah, good. So with respect to adverse effects, so we're able to manage this in our research setting because we very carefully screen people. We prepare them for these sessions. They're in the presence of two sitters throughout the day-long session. We meet with them after the sessions and then, and then subsequently follow them up. And under those conditions, we actually haven't had any very significant adverse events at all. However, in absence of all those parameters, there are risks. The first and, and most probable one is that people will become terrified and engage in dangerous behavior. They can run out into traffic. People can jump off of cliffs or jump out of windows. It does happen. They can put themselves or others at risk, even life-threatening risk, and there are you know, homicides and suicides that can occur. It's low probability, but it does occur. The other most salient risk, and one that we protect against, and for which there's the empirical evidence is circumstantial, but it's uh, something that we're very cautious about. The idea is that People who have vulnerability to psychotic process, people who may be at risk for developing schizophrenia, may be at increased risk 
for development of such disorders with a, a high dose of a psychedelic. And so there are reports of people, you know, particularly in their, you know, late teens or early 20s that coincide with the, the most probable time of onset of psychotic mm -hmm. disorder who take a psychedelic and, you know, are subsequently diagnosed as schizophrenic and they attribute the onset of that to having taken the psychedelic. And that's a, a lifelong nightmare from which there's no simple recovery. So that's, you know, that's a yeah. very important cautionary note. Do you screen out, let's say someone has a first order relative suffering from schizophrenia? Do you screen them out of your research protocol? What's the actual criterion? Yeah, we do. And we're probably, we may be overly conservative, but I think that's the way to proceed. We'll screen mm -hmm. out second degree relatives. If anyone has a second degree relative with a psychotic illness, we'll screen them out. Right. Now, we ran a large survey study in almost 2,000 people describing their worst experience after taking psilocybin. And the results of that were interesting. So now this isn't a population estimate in so far as these are people who came upon our advertisement online, were willing to spend an hour completing a really detailed questionnaire anonymously, and they were completing it with regard to their very worst experience. But of that group, 11% reported putting themselves or others at risk for physical harm, 3% sought medical help, and 10% reported enduring adverse psychological symptoms lasting more than a year, and about 8% of those sought out treatment. So there's a, you know, there's a significant population of people who at least are claiming that they had this terrible experience, and a year later, they're still seeking out help for what they view as some kind of psychological problem, depression or, or psychotic or, you know, thinking disorders that they're attributing to that. Now, that's not, you know, tight causality, but it fits in line with the kinds of things that we should be concerned about and makes us apprehensive about premature, widespread use of these compounds in the general population. Right. With respect to your point about physical toxicity, it's true, that's, that's incredibly limited. So it'd be very hard to overdose with these compounds. They don't produce drug-seeking behavior. They're not considered classic drugs of abuse. In fact, if one takes them repeatedly, one becomes tolerant to their effects, that is the effects uh, reduce. There's no withdrawal symptoms. We can't get animals to self-administer reliably psychedelics and, that, and, and we have paradigms which are very predictive of abuse liability of compounds in humans. And, and most of those come out simply negative with psychedelics. So they're not classic drugs of abuse. Just a word to the wise, you, you need to remove the cocaine dispenser in the cage before you give them the psilocybin dispenser. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so the probability of getting animals to self-administer cocaine is, well, at least in our studies in baboons, is virtually 100%. There's not, mm -hmm. you know, under the right conditions, mammals are designed in such a way that you make cocaine available to them and they're going to take it. And that's not the case with psychedelics. As far as the pharmacology there, is it thought that these just don't drive the dopamine system? Mm -hmm. Do we think dopamine is simply not involved or is just not involved to the degree that drugs of abuse drive it? Well, let's see. So the pharmacology of psychedelics is very different than most of those classic drugs of abuse. And, and most of them are thought to have their reinforcing effects mediated either immediately or downstream through some kind of dopaminergic mechanism. The psychedelics differ with respect to having dopaminergic effects. LSD is one that is 
said to be very promiscuous pharmacologically, and it does have some mm -hmm. dopaminergic effects, but certainly not to an extent that would drive self-administration of the type that we see with other drugs. That being said, I, I should say that MDMA ecstasy, which is not a classic psychedelic, does serve as a, a reinforcer in laboratory animals, does have a dopaminergic mm -hmm. component to it. So they're very different kinds of compounds. Well, well, actually, let's start with MDMA because this is the one where you know rumors of its toxicity have seemed most indelible, and you know, ironically, I think these rumors originate, or at least they were amplified from your own uh, institution, from Johns Hopkins. I think it was George Ricarte who published a paper, which now, if I'm not mistaken is viewed as being somewhat under the shadow of either political topspin or you know some other less than rigorous line of thinking about uh, MDMA and its place in the culture what what's your current understanding of the physical toxicity of MDMA so MDMA has been associated with neurotoxicity and and that's indisputable george ricarte has done a lot of of that work, but so have others. So in preclinical studies, MDMA is neurotoxic to serotonergic systems. And I, that's been pretty clearly demonstrated. The issue about George Ricarte uh, retraction of an article was one, it was a study published in Science in which he published a study and then subsequently found that the drug that he thought he had been giving and had published as MDMA was in fact methamphetamine. And there's no issue that methamphetamine would produce that kind of toxicity. But I think that one misstep on his part has kind of blown out of proportion okay. a little bit. So there, re there really is a toxicity, but the issue there with respect to humans is whether the dosing parameters that produce those kinds of effects in laboratory animals are relevant to therapeutic uh, use of MDMA. Right. And that's a deeply contentious issue within that area. FDA has allowed therapeutic trials with MDMA to go forward, I think under the assumption that the doses given of MDMA and the number of times that it's given, that's really up to three occasions, are going to very likely be under any threshold to detect neurotoxicity. However, there are studies that have looked at people who have used MDMA extensively. These are people using high doses in rave situations where they're using enormous doses and they're using them repeatedly. And there's some indication of memory problems and other sorts of dysfunctionality. Mm. It's not a clean slate. There is potential for toxicity. We don't know the extent of it. But what we do know is that's very different than the classic psychedelics, that is psilocybin, LSD, DMT, and mescaline that are not associated with any such toxicity. And for reference here, so what is considered the, the appropriate human dose for MDMA? Let's see. Well, I think the clinical doses that are being used range from about 75 milligrams to, to 125, I think. Right. I know clinically in Europe, they use higher doses. Uh, the protocols that are running right now sponsored by MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, mm -hmm. give MDMA twice. They'll start with a dose of something like 75 and then give a booster dose uh, an hour later. But that's around the range. So yeah, I mean, MDMA is, again, not a classic psychedelic. What's the, the term of jargon now that we like? Is it called an empathogen? Is that, <laughs> is that achieved currency? Yeah, that's it. One of the terms is the love drug, and actually, uh, you yourself have t <laughs> have testified to yeah. life changing experience with yeah. with MDMA, and so that effect 
is remarkable for that sense of unbounded love and you know, open heartedness that emerges under that experience. And it's being shown to be quite effective in treatment of post traumatic stress disorder. And those are the clinical trials that are ongoing now under the sponsorship of the MAPS group. And they're proceeding and their effect sizes look very large and promising such that we might expect approval of MDMA as a medicine in anywhere four to six years. Yeah. So I just linger on the, on the prospect of toxicity for another second. So I, I guess the allegations I've heard here, one is that the studies that showed neurotoxicity in rodents were under doses that were just, you know, as you say, not analogous to human use. I don't know what the factor of multiplication was there, but you know, much larger doses than uh, would be analogous in a human body. And uh, I guess the rave data could be confounded by what else ravers are up to, you know, dancing for 12 hours straight mm -hmm. uh, and not drinking water or what, you know, I mean, there's issues with you know, overheating. What's your sense of, given the current state of things, of the risk that people run taking MDMA? Uh, I mean, let's leave aside, I mean, again, we're gonna, we'll finish on a, a some description of of what would be optimal in terms of people getting access to drugs should we arrive at a future where you know their therapeutic use is very well regulated but so you know leaving aside the concern that you know someone might be taking on, on the street may not even be MDMA what are your concerns about MDMA's toxicity and the normal dosage you know let's say in one of these therapeutic trials i don't know it's notable that FDA has approved this as a therapeutic agent. And so it's below their threshold of concern it, if given as, you know, as suggested, it should be inside that protocols that have been approved. I don't know. What I suspect is there's little risk for low dose, very intermittent exposure, but that's simply I guess, you know, our ability to, <laughs> you know, to tease out things like long-term neurotoxicity is given just the adaptability of the brain is crude at best. Yeah. Let's move on to the classic psychedelics, which, as you say, are LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, and DMT. And DMT occurs in a pure form that people, you know, have smoked or have had injected. And it also is one of the active components in a traditional drug like ayahuasca. And then there's also 5-MeO-DMT, which is how anyone first discovered that this was something you could take. It has to be a pretty colorful story because this occurs in the secretions of a venomous toad that some, some intrepid person wound up smoking at some point in human history. How would you like to begin here? I'd like to talk about these compounds and their utility and how you view them as different or, or the same. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So the classic psychedelics all have a primary site of action, and that's serotonin 2A receptor. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of defines them. The, the ones that have been used most frequently, as you say, are DMT and mescaline, which is active in the peyote cactus used by Native American, and psilocybin, which is certainly been widely used, particularly in Mexico and other parts of the world as, as the magic mushroom. And then LSD, which is a synthesized compound that was first synthesized in 1943. All of those compounds have their primary site of action at serotonin 2A. And there's every reason to believe that most of the interesting effects that they produce are mediated through that receptor signaling pathway. And that's been shown through a series of animal studies, antagonist studies, studies using knockout mice where they knock out serotonin 2A, and then human studies where they can give selective antagonists at that receptor site and block the effects of these drugs. 
That being said, they're certainly not identical. They're more similar than different, but they have different onsets. They have different duration of actions. And in some cases hit, well, in all cases, they also hit different sets of receptors. And the most complex of those being LSD that hits a variety of different receptor targets. So frustrating to me and those of us interested in this area is that good double-blinded studies have not been conducted that actually compare these drugs. So there's a lot of anecdotal reports about differences among these compounds, but you know, we won't know for sure about those differences until we can give them under adequately blinded conditions to people under uniform conditions of controlling for expectancy. Right. But they're, again, they're, they're more similar than different. They all produce the set of experiences, as I described with our initial study with methylphenidate, they're going to produce visual illusions and emotionality and cognitive changes. But I think that far and away, the most interesting area with these drugs is that they produce at least two kinds of very memorable effects. One is that they're quite apt to produce under supported conditions, under optimized conditions. They're likely to produce a constellation of phenomenological effects that really map onto classical mystical type experiences. So, you know, the the description of those and actually psychologists in the psychology of religion who have paid a lot of attention to that and develop questionnaires that probe those kinds of effects and have factor analyzed the components of those effects would suggest that those effects can be described as six kinds of categorical features. One being the sense of unity, the sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things. Another is a sense of the preciousness of these experiences. Some people might use the term sacredness or reverence, but there's something compellingly, impressively deserving of respect mm -hmm. for these experiences. There's a sense that's described by William James as the noetic sense, the sense that there's something more real and more true about these experiences than everyday waking consciousness. And then there are positive mood, very often sense of open-heartedness, transcendence, joy, transcendence of time and space where the past and the future collapse into the present moment. So it's all about right now. Space becomes either vast or endless or totally empty. And then this sense of ineffability, one of the first things that people say after having such an experience is that I can't put it into, into words. Those are the features of something we call the mystical type experience. And I, I regret that was a branding error on our part to, to uh, develop a scale with that name because it, it's mm. an empirically derived scale. It doesn't assume yeah, any non non material kind of spiritual realities. It's just hard hardcore science, and you know we've done the appropriate psychometrics to evaluate that scale. There is a justification for it in the sense that these kinds of experiences are the classical, contemplative, religious, mystical experiences, which are again the experiences of a human brain under some parameters and. It's just a fact that these drugs are not producing experiences that the brain isn't capable of having. I mean, you would expect somebody somewhere to have experiences precisely of this kind without having ingested one of these compounds, because these, these compounds are just mimicking neurotransmitters or changing their level of, of action uh, you know, at the synapse. And LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT. I mean, in the case of DMT, DMT is already an endogenous neurotransmitter itself whose action I'm not sure we, we yet understand. 
in either case, whether you're Meister Eckhart espousing your heretical unity with God, or you're somebody who has taken a psychedelic, the resulting experience is something the brain is doing. Absolutely. And I mean, for me, Sam, that's exactly what makes this so exciting. They, these experiences map on to these naturally occurring mystical type experiences. And so the puzzle up, up until now has been, what are these experiences? You know, are they believable? And, and they, haven't, they haven't been amenable to prospective scientific study because they occur unpredictably and erratically. I mean, they, you know, it's more probable if someone engages in spiritual austerities or goes on long-term meditation retreats or does prayer practice, but by no means are they, are they probable. And there's some people who are given to interpreting them as a gift of divine grace. So of course you can't manipulate them. And, and what, I, what I see that we have with psilocybin, because we can occasion these experiences in a very high proportion of people that we prepare and, and run through our protocol, like 80%. Hmm. So that to me speaks to the, to the fact that these are biologically normal effects. We're wired for them, if, if you will. And it, and it raises a whole bunch of interesting questions about what, what kind of evolutionary selectivity has gone on there, if that's the mechanism, and presumably, that, that makes these experiences probable. And then what in the world are their function, both culturally, you know, and for the survival of our species? And, and this is <laughs> kind of leans into into your interest in the well-being of conscious creatures. I think there's, I mean, I think there's something uniquely interesting about the resulting impact of these experiences, because one thing I really haven't talked about is what the, con the long-term consequences of having these kinds of experiences are. But, you know, it turns out that people months after this, after this experience, if asked, how important was that experience or how meaningful was that experience on a, on a lifetime scale from, you know, like a daily experience to once a week, once a month, once a year, once every five years, you know, 10 most, five most, single most important or meaningful experience of your life. We have about 80%, 90% of people saying it's in the top five hmm. most meaningful, spiritually significant experiences of their entire lifetime, comparing it to the birth of a firstborn child or the death of a parent. And that is simply astounding to me. So as a clinical pharmacologist who's worked with dozens of psychoactive drugs and given them at high doses to people and I'm accustomed to querying people about their effects, that observation literally blew me away because there's something about these experiences that people interpret as having enduring meaning going forward. I mean, so if you give a high dose of a opiate or a sedative or cocaine and ask, ask someone a month later, tell me about that experience, they'll remember it. Oh yeah. You know, it's like I got drunk, you know, we had, we were laughing, we had fun, whatever. But it's just, it's a memory. The people who have these kinds of experiences really talk about the enduring salience of that experience. It's not uncommon for people to say, you know, I continue to think about that experience every day, or it's just inform my life going forward. And that's the curiosity about, about these, uh, these effects. The other component about it that I think is so interesting is that it has this strong positive valence to it, very often in a strong pro-social direction. So there's something about these experiences. I think it's particularly the unity, the sense that everything is connected and the, 
profound sense that we're all in this together. There's something incredibly humbling mm. about these experiences. And if that's coupled with the reverence for it and the truth value of it, that this is real, more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness, that becomes reorganizational in a way that I, I think has profound ethical and moral implications. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just tempted to echo some of that. And I, I guess I would put MDMA into this class as well, just for, for the purposes of this distinction. But the point you make in your, your inventory around the, the noetic quality of, of the experience, the fact that something, when it, when it goes well, I and mean, again, we, we should always remind people that it's possible to have a bad trip that has a very different character here where and again, uh, I leave MDMA out of this, but it, with classic psychedelics, you can have an experience that is very much like psychosis. And when you come down, you, you are, you're having the experience of your, your sanity being restored to you. But when you have a good experience on, let's say, LSD, and here I would also include MDMA, it is the experience of something that certainly seems more true more real mm -hmm. and when you come down from that place the phenomenon is one of having you know your usual habits of mind your usual preoccupations your the, the, the ways in which you tend to use your attention begin to obscure this deeper truth that was laid bare during the the peak of the experience and that's what's so it's among the things that makes these experiences so durably transformative because what you can no longer deny, you know, after having, having seen this is that it's possible or should be possible to live from a much deeper place, to be engaged with the present moment in a way that conduces to awe and reverence and a recognition of beauty that by tendency you are disposed to overlook, mm -hmm. right? And, and you're, it's just you're viewing your life through this, this kind of scrim of discursive thinking and judgment and reactivity and self-talk and for reasons which you're beginning to understand pharmacologically, that gets held in abeyance for a time and you have this full-on collision with the intrinsic beauty of, of consciousness in the present. It can't just become a memory because it, it becomes a reference point. Hence, the, the the very common experience of seeking out meditation and other techniques of changing one's engagement with the present moment because they're both legal and you know they they have fewer risks. You know when when used ad libitum, the transformative power of of even one experience is not really mysterious once you've had it. Yeah. But let me just comment that it's relatively rare. I mean, when we consider the millions of young people who got exposed to psychedelics back in the 60s, it was only a very tiny fraction that, that were drawn into meditation and going off on a path of seeking. For most people hmm. under these kinds of conditions, the experience is, if not uncomfortable, even if it's transcendent, there, there's no conceptual frame. There's no way to understand it. And so it's very often just put in a box hmm. and forgotten about. And, and that's, that's where, that's my enthusiasm. So we have actually studied now psychedelics in beginning meditators and in long-term meditators, because I think there's a convergence of those practices. I think that both are complementary uh, approaches to exploration of the nature of mind and meditation it seems to me is the tried and true course but it's uh, very difficult indeed to to reach some of those states and and sustain them i think of psychedelics as the crash course and i think optimally some wise conjoint use of them may be the the best approach to producing sustained senses of, of well-being and appreciation. Hmm. Is there any reason to prefer 
naturally occurring compounds like the psilocybin in magic mushrooms or the mescaline in peyote over LSD or MDMA? Or is the, is the distinction between what is synthesized and what is naturally occurring spurious? And if so, what do you see the prospects of our devising new compounds that are even more interesting in terms of their effects? Hmm. Well, let's see. So with respect to synthesized, if, let's just take psilocybin. Is there a difference mm -hmm. between synthesized psilocybin and psilocybin delivered in the form of mushrooms? You know, we don't know. They have, they've never been compared head to head. People have strong opinions uh, that surely there are differences. As a pharmacologist, I doubt that there are meaningful differences. There's a, theoretically a possibility something like psilocybin also has other potentially psychoactive tryptamines in it. So there, there could be some qualitative differences. You, you mean, you mean the, the mushroom may have things in addition to psilocybin? Yes. Yeah. It, uh, we, we know it does. And yeah. some of those are psychoactive, but you know how those interact with psilocybin and whether they're at doses sufficient to alter the nature of the effects is is unknown. Yeah, actually, you're you're answering a slightly different question, which I which I should have asked. But yeah, I was I was taking it sort of a, as a given that that you know synthesizing psilocybin is getting you the the real molecule. Okay, and it would be the same as what's in the mushroom. But I, I guess the some people might have a bias, or at least imagine that there's there's good reason to to prefer a chemistry that you know we, we've evolved around right so th these are compounds that that have been in in mm -hmm. plants and even in ourselves for millions of years and then there are molecules that people just invent mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. and have whatever effects they have and you you have someone like Sasha Shulgin who mm -hmm. was you know holed up in his lab in in Berkeley just cranking out new psychedelics, you know, many of which I think he's the only person on earth who ever took. So what do you think about that? I mean, in terms of just pure innovation in this space pharmacologically? Let's see. So as a psychopharmacologist, I, I think the prospects are just remarkable. I mean, there, there are probably thousands of variants of these that can be synthesized and examined, and there are going to be differences among them. I don't have any strong a priori reason to think that that the naturally occurring substances are are going to be better than than synthesized compounds but I you know I suppose that may be the case but I just see this area as just ripe for an explosion of investigation of the nature of these effects, the nature of mind, if you will, the nature of consciousness. Mm. You know, I sometimes feel because we were able to reinitiate these studies in, in naive people after this, you know, decades long hiatus, you know, I feel kind of like Rip Van Winkle, you know, waking up with the tools of science today and, and everything that could have been done and that wasn't done for yeah. uh, several decades. And, and what I see is the prospects for this just to continue to unfold unless somehow this project goes off the, off the rails prematurely and we get a, a societal clampdown on, on these compounds, which I think would be tragic as far as I'm concerned. There's so much to learn about the nature of human experience, the nature of consciousness, but in particular, the implications for ethical and moral behavior, I think is preeminent for me. Mm. As I think it, it is for you, I'm sure, because of your interest in moral landscape and, and meditation. And I think there's something unique about these experiences that shine a bright light on the nature of consciousness, although we don't understand it. And that and something to do with the deepest roots of the moral and ethical behavior that comes out of this understanding that is just, that comes so clearly through these experiences that we're all in this together. We're all, mm -hmm. one of the things that 
just strikes me about these experiences is that one is confronted with the unlikely fact that we're, here we you, we find ourselves as these highly evolved creatures over millions of years who can navigate the world. We have vision, we can manipulate things, we have developed mathematics and uh, language and ways of thinking, we've developed science. But the most amazing piece of this is that we are aware that we're aware and we don't have a reason and answer for that is you and and your wife uh, has wonderfully written in her book conscious you know the hard problem of consciousness is not solved but what is apparent when one is deeply contemplating that is the mystery of that and mm. the sense of the enormity of the of that mystery the gratitude for me at least that arises from being gifted this opportunity to to exist in this playground of consciousness the wonder of what what in the world does that mean and kind of the humility of that and then recognizing that all conscious beings share that we're all kind of entrapped this is what we know this is the only thing that we know is that we're mm. conscious right it's the only thing we're really certain of and and once you recognize of that of yourself it's humbling and you, then you recognize it in other people and there's this sense that geez, we're, we are in this together. We need to take care of ourselves <laughs> and one another if we're going to survive as a species. And there's something just so uplifting about that. I'm guessing that's the, you know, that's what guides you and in your interest in developing, you know, the Waking Up app and teaching people the prospect of investigating the nature of consciousness and the nature of self. And I think these yeah. are super powerful tools yeah. that go right along that same line. Yeah, well, so you know, one of the features of the psychedelic experience that people find so transformative, and it's the one that's directly targeted by meditation, is this suppression or cutting through of the sense of self. Mm -hmm. Again, we, we have to issue the the obvious caveats there there are ways in which a sense of self can be eroded or destabilized which are not optimal and and are not what we're talking about here but there's a a loss of self which really is synonymous with you know the center of the bullseye from a, a contemplative point of view and mm -hmm. is is the thing that can sometimes uh, you know even often happen with some psychedelics which which is so notable that you just you experience i mean it is the thing that that allows for the unity experiences of the kind you described i um, mean there's no longer a, a boundary between the knower and the known you're no longer you're standing on the side of the world looking in you are for a moment or for an, an apparent eternity depending on how deep the experience is you are uh, identical to the the condition in which the world and everything else is appearing again it's, it's it's early days in terms of the the underlying neuroscience of this but one feature seems to be that we have these structures in the brain that have been linked together in a construct which is called the default mode network which mm -hmm. is a series of midline areas in the brain which come online preferentially when people are whether when their minds are wandering, when they're just thinking quietly to themselves and not really on a task. And these regions are further invoked when you give someone a task that is explicitly self-referential, when they have to think about whether, you know, adjectives apply to themselves or have to think about, um, you know, some kind of narrative reconstruction of, of something that re refers to them. And so this is it seems to be again in, in the studies that have been done that meditation diminishes activity in these in this network and psilocybin does as well i i guess i'm asking you is it, has the research been done on lsd and and mescaline and dmt do we know what they do to the default mode network 
LSD uh, also uh, decreases function in the default mode network. I believe DMT does in as ayahuasca, but I'm I'm uh, uncertain. But it does it does seem to be a relatively uh, robust finding across a number of different investigations, and, and it it makes wonderful sense because it really is connected with the sense of self-referential processing and that's decreased or in long-term meditators it's decreased under psilocybin interestingly activity in the default mode network is increased in depression mm. and psilocybin is being evaluated for treatment of depression so it it makes this wonderful story but i guess i would also underscore you know, what a primitive understanding we have of the, yeah. the nature of self and consciousness. And it's it's surely going to be way more complex than that. But it's, but that's a, a level of analysis and consistency of finding that's really captured the imagination and is explicable. It, it's a great start, but we have a long ways to go before we understand it. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the other confound here I would introduce is that, from my point of view, from the point of view of meditation and the the loss of self that is experienced there, it need not be associated with anything changing at the level of the the contents of consciousness. Really. I mean, you can have a very ordinary, entirely sober, mm -hmm. uh, non psychedelic awareness of your the visual scene, say, mm -hmm. and you know, if you know how to be mindful of the the intrinsic selflessness of consciousness, well, then it's just obvious that there's no subject in the head being aware of the visual scene. There's simply the visual scene. And that experience can be had, you know, the, the sense of self can really be dissected out of conscious experience in a way that doesn't entail many of the other effects that, that are classically associated with psychedelics. I mean, there's a lot more you get on psychedelics in addition to a loss of self, if indeed you get that at all, depending on your experience. Yeah, I, let's see. I absolutely agree. I, you know, I think one really interesting area of future investigation is to look at low-dose psychedelics mm -hmm. under under conditions of meditation yeah actually i meant to ask you that because obviously microdosing is very much in vogue what's your uh, understanding of that and, and attitude toward it <laughs> i don't think i don't think we really understand anything about uh microdosing it's you know there's there's no science behind it i mean there's but it is in vogue it's I don't doubt that there are effects there. It's a difficult kind of uh, project to undertake scientifically because uh, in order to do it, uh, you need permission to give people psychedelics and let them out in the wild. And mm. I think most review committees are going to be reluctant to do that, allow that. But I, I think that needs, needs to be done. There was, I don't know if you saw the recent study of, we've done a study in long-term meditators. We haven't published it yet, but there was a recent study of uh, psilocybin given to people on a Buddhist uh, retreat. It was, uh, I think it was a six-day retreat mm -hmm. and half the group got psilocybin on day five. They got a, a moderate dose of psilocybin, but not a microdose. The other half, mm -hmm. half didn't. And they produce all the kinds of effects that we would expect and, and the kinds of effects that we've seen in long-term meditators that actually people find that it deepens their practice, they're more engaged with it. In the case of the retreat, the deeper the experience on psilocybin, the more positive enduring effects they had at, at four months. And and that's what we found that in spite of the fact that people may have tens of thousands of hours of experience with meditation, that nonetheless, they find these experiences to be informative and interesting in ways that they find useful for their, most, most people, useful for their contemplative 
practice. Hmm. They're less likely, however, to find them uh, discontinuous with anything that they might have expected out of out of their contemplative experience because they're accustomed to understanding the nature of mind, the nature of appearances of objects in mind and de-identifying with those. So they're, mm -hmm. I, I think of long-term meditators, uh, if they come out, out of certain contemplative conditions are advantaged in terms of being able to learn from these experiences uniquely. And what I'm intrigued with is what, you know, what could be made of low dose, repeated low dose experiences under conditions where people were really taking them into contemplative practice and mm. trying to learn further about the nature of, of mind. What do you make of the fact that DMT is endogenous to the brain and, and also that the, the pharmacology of it seems unique in that I now speak as one who's never taken DMT. I've, I've never taken ayahuasca and I've never smoked DMT, but apparently smoking DMT gives you not only what is reputed to be the, the most intense psychedelic experience, but the time course is incredibly short. I mean, it's like a, a 10 minute experience as opposed to 10 hours with something like LSD. And again, this is a compound that already exists in the body. How, how do you think about that phenomenon? You know, I don't know. There's, you know, there's a, a lot of speculation that maybe that accounts for near death experiences or prophetic experiences, but it's, it's arguable whether DMT occurs in concentration sufficient to produce mm -hmm. effects. But I can tell you it's, it's really an interesting compound. We, we just have completed, actually I'm writing up right now, a pretty large survey study in which we were asking people who had experience with DMT and reported this phenomena that seems most probable with DMT, although it occurs with other psychedelics, of encountering a seemingly autonomous entity. Yeah. And so Terence McKenna spoke a lot about the machine elves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was just deeply curious about that because we had actually also earlier had conducted this survey of, of uh, experiences that people interpreted as encountering God or God of their understanding. Well, this was DMT encountering entities. And I was, I was prepared to believe based on what I had read about these kinds of experiences that they were going to be bizarre, dysphoric uh, kinds of experiences, you know, often unpleasant. Uh, Rick Straussman talks about people feeling like they're being experimented on or, you know, there could be insectoid kind of bizarre I, creatures. I, I, if I recall correctly from his book, his book is titled The DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Mm -hmm. uh, at least one person felt that they were being raped by a crocodile. Yeah. <laughs> which yeah. doesn't yeah. immediately recommend itself. <laughs> <laughs> no, but here's, this really kind of was fascinating to me. Num so number one, so this was like, over 2,000 people. You know, when we posted this thing, people were just dying to, you know, give an hour to tell, tell us about this experience. So there's this <laughs> group of people who've had experiences that are, you know, dying to try to explain them. And, and so one thing that comes out is that there, there was no modal description of the nature of that entity. You know, it's most often described as a being or a guide or a spirit, most people felt like they communicated uh, with that entity. They described the predominant uh, emotions that they and the entity experienced as love, kindness, and joy. That was a surprise. Uh, they f but they felt this, much like our God Encounter survey, when we asked them, what attributes does this did this entity have? Uh, and, and, and let me just say, they're saying that this entity was more real than everyday waking consciousness. They believe that this entity existed. It continued to exist after the experience, profoundly changed their basic conception of reality. We ask them, what attributes do they attribute to this being? Uh, 
And the top ones were intelligence, consciousness, and benevolence. So it, it, it very much like the God encounter survey. And a great factoid for you, Sam, is that those among those who identified as atheists before that significantly dropped to about a third. So people who considered themselves to be atheists were less likely to identify as such afterwards. And I take that to mean not that they became theists, but they were humbled by what they don't know and the certainty yeah. with which they were willing to assert that. But people are attributing all kinds of positive changes to this, enduring changes in life meaning and purpose. And I'm actually now thinking that this this is connecting with near-death experiences and even some of this older literature, I hate to say it, on alien abductions. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're I think we're playing around with phenomena within the brain that that produce these attributions of sentient others intelligence and consciousness and how and why those are wired into us is is is, is really a fascinating question yeah well yeah so th this was if i recall correctly this possible experience was not in your original inventory and this is this is again this is an experience i haven't had and this is it's it seems routinely had smoking dmt and it seems like it, it can be often had with high doses of psilocybin. I don't often hear about people having this experience of, on LSD, which is beyond having your own perception of self and world totally transfigured and, you know, having, you know, experiences of unity and, and awe and all the rest. It's the experience of feeling that you are suddenly in relationship to a sentient other of yes. some kind, whether that be yes. a, an offending crocodile or, or something more benevolent. And it's that sense of, of relationship. Obviously, that, that occurs in people who don't necessarily even feel that they have lost their sense of self. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can have a, a, a self-other encounter. But the hallmark of the experience is that, in addition to all the visual changes, on you know on something like DMT uh, apparently or beyond spectacular there is again a feeling that you have come into contact with something that has an independent point of view mm -hmm. and is communicating with you and that that is a yeah I can imagine that uh, pushes your ontology around a little bit yeah so I'm I'm now thinking of this in terms of ontological shock that people have these experiences and and they they just need to reconfigure their their ideas of what's real and what's not and people ascribe very positive enduring effects to this but i could certainly also imagine them not being so yeah it's our god encounter survey cuz i think that's <laughs> that's playing right into your your wheelhouse so we did this study asking people whether they had had an encounter of God, uh, ultimate reality, higher power, or God of their understanding, or an emissary of God. And we asked that of people having had taken a variety of different psychedelics, psilocybin, ayahuasca, LSD, and smoke DMT. We also asked that of people who had had that experience in absence of ever taking a psychedelic, the so-called naturally occurring conversion kind of experiences. Mm. And we, and we asked the same set of, of questions. And so there, people are saying, yes, I encountered something more real than real. It continued to exist. It was conscious. They very often sacred. It was benevolent. It was intelligent. I think the interesting thing about that was that the naturally occurring God encounter experiences looked ever so much the same i mean so again i think we're we're modeling something here that has to do with the human condition that transcends the pharmacology certainly and then the question is what's yeah what's going on how 
how does this work? Why, why does it work? <laughs> What's it all about? Hmm. I seem to recall with, in the, the, uh, in Strassman's DMT research, that one violation of expectations was that the encounters were not of, uh, not with any traditional figures that you would expect people to have been, you know, kind of culturally primed to encounter. So, you know, the Christians are not meeting Jesus or the Virgin Mary or, you know, their favorite saint. The encounters were with this bizarre range of, you know, alien insect-like, mm -hmm. as you say, Terence McKenna talked about the, the self-transforming machine elves. It seems to be, again, I'm sure there are exceptions to this, but the literature seems to suggest that you know, the, the encounters are sort of orthogonal to culture or, you know, cultural mm -hmm. expectations. Yeah, I mean, that's what pulled us into wanting to look at the DMT encounters because they, they just seem so bizarre. And as a matter of fact, I could really kick myself. We, we did not ask the mystical experience questionnaire, which we've asked of all of our clinical studies our, and all of our other online surveys, because my expectation was surely these aren't going to be mystical experiences. But in spite of the fact that they're kind of bizarrely, often bizarrely salient and surprising experiences, they still had some of these qualities that um, lead me to think that at least some component or some proportion of them, you, you would have met categories of mystical experience. But, they, yeah. but the overlay of, or the salience of them, of this encounter with an other, and very often there's initial fear involved in that encounter. But this encounter with the other is just the kind of the salient focus of these experiences. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you're being handed the, the sacrament, in the end, you may not care that it's a praying mantis handing it to you rather than the mother of God. Uh, <laughs> but if it's a crocodile <laughs> penetration, you might, yeah. you might want to think about that. So uh, I, I got to have a final question about how the, where this is all going or where we hope it's going. But one more compound to ask you about here, uh, where does ketamine fit into the picture? Because I know that's being used as a, um, a possible treatment for um, treatment-resistant depression. It also is not a classic psychedelic. It's more of an anesthetic or a dissociative, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ketamine is an NMDA antagonist. So it, pharmacologically, it's different. It's uh, considered a, as a class to be those of a dissociative anesthetic type compound. It's sometimes been phenomenologically described as a psychedelic. And, and we actually ran a a very rigorous trial comparing dextromethorphan, which happens to be cough medicine, it's the active ingredient in Robitussin, but Robitussin mm -hmm. is given at very low doses. If you give, if you drink entire bottles of Robitussin, and I wouldn't recommend it, we gave about 400 milligrams, you actually end up with some phenomenology that significantly overlaps with psilocybin and hmm. got intrigued with that because the initial study we did with dextromethorphan alone, we had psychonauts, people who were experienced with uh, psychoactives and, and psychedelics. We had a number of them saying, oh, you know, you gave me psilocybin and that kind of, that got my attention. And so we ran a head to head comparison under deeply blinded conditions and it's a really rigorous study comparing psilocybin directly to dextromethorphan. And we looked at a range of doses of psilocybin so we could construct dose effect curves so you're not making an error by simply uh, choosing incorrect doses to compare. And what that shows very clearly is that dextromethorphan, and, and we would presume that to be very much like ketamine because its mechanism of action is the same, is going to produce mystical type experiences. It produces visual effects. 
it's associated with more sedation and more uh, nausea. But the mystical type experiences are in grayscale compared to technicolor in, mm. in psilocybin. Uh, the enduring meaning is, is much less. You know, it's not, it's, it just doesn't have the salience of the experience with uh, psilocybin. So I would judge it to be run a, you know, a, a poor second next to the, what I'm guessing would be all of the classic uh, psychedelics. But nonetheless, it does produce certainly uh, some significant elements of those kinds of effects. And I, and I think actually more should be made out of paying attention to set and setting under conditions in which people are receiving ketamine, because I think there could be an opportunity to weave more meaning making out of those experiences than is currently done, because these are usually given in a clinical situation where people are, you know, given an IV or they're given a sublingual dose and they're just left alone for mm -hmm. a couple of hours. And, and it's really thought to just be a pharmacological intervention for depression. And it is, it, it does produce direct effects on depression, but they're short lived. Right. Okay. So what does success look like down this path? I mean, you, you're really on the front lines of doing this research. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier in the conversation, you know, you're hopeful that we don't see some government backlash based on, you know, the mere change in the political winds. Assuming we've reached a tipping point here and we're not going to recapitulate the errors of the, the 70s and, and 80s and 90s, what does success look like? How do you imagine these compounds and, and any future psychedelics we might, we might discover being integrated into society? And what, what does responsible administration of all this look like? I mean, whether, whether we're talking about treatment for clinical issues like depression, or end of life care, or um, just just the betterment of of well people. Yeah, and I would add to that what we can learn about uh, science and the nature of mind. But yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Let me just pick up on what the potential clinical applications are. So right now there are two entities that are that are developing FDA approved trials to investigate psilocybin as a treatment either for a major depressive disorder or treatment resistant depression and those are multi-site clinical trials in phase 2b which is immediately before the final regulatory trials often called uh, phase 3 trials and uh results early results from studies of that sort, including a study that we'll be publishing within the next few months, we just have completed a study in depression, look really quite promising. And so I think that's probably an achievable goal. How long it will take is never possible to predict. It really depends on how clean those trials look like and what FDA requires as auxiliary studies to Port approval, but my guess is that approval for either treatment resistant depression or major depressive disorder could be forthcoming in, you know, five to seven years, may possibly sooner. And this is this is psilocybin. Psilocybin, right? Yeah. We had also formally run and published a study, and as well as uh, NYU in individuals who had a cancer diagnosis and, and had significant psychological distress, that is either de they were either depressed or anxious. And there we were able to show that a single session with psilocybin produced immediate and enduring decreases, very substantial decreases in depression and anxiety out to six months. And 
and presumably much longer. And we've interviewed people way past that point. That actually struck us as being the ideal initial indication to reintroduce uh, yeah. psychedelics into our culture. I was going to say, it strikes me immediately like that, because when you're talking about people with a, with a terminal diagnosis, you know, concerns about addiction or any other spectrum of effects in their life just, you know, obviously are canceled. And the compassionate intent to mitigate their depression and anxiety around, in this case, dying of cancer, it's so easy to to sell well, the first phase. it turned out not to be so easy to sell to regulators because Amazing. they're they uh, immediately have to ask whether this indication is has pseudo specificity. That is, is there really anything special about depression and cancer patients? Yeah, because if it is effective more broadly in the population, that would be a bigger and more important target. And I, strategically, I would have personally preferred to go with end of life or life-threatening depression or anxiety, but that was a choice that was not made. Other other people may pick that up, but you know the prospect of and the costs of running these regulatory trials is is enormous. And so those were the decisions that were made. So depression would be the first indication, but I I would say that oh and then the other very promising indication is different forms of substance abuse. So we have run a trial, Matt Johnson, who's a colleague with me here at Hopkins, has spearheaded a trial of psilocybin treatment of tobacco cessation in addicted smokers when we had a, a small pilot study, proof of concept study that showed 80% biologically verified abstinence at six months, which is absolutely unheard of in the yeah. cigarette smoking cessation field. And we're pursuing now a randomized uh, control trial looking at uh, psilocybin and smoking cessation. There are other institutions that are investigating psilocybin for treatment of alcoholism and one looking at it for treatment of cocaine dependence. I think one of the ex very exciting prospects of psilocybin is that it's going to have this cross diagnostic applicability efficacy. And so, unlike most treatments that we're accustomed to in psychiatry that are really targeted to a specific receptor site population that's relevant to the disease entity, this appears to be a higher order kind of effect that may cut across a variety of therapeutic applications. So within our new center, we have a whole bunch of new therapeutic targets. We're going to be looking at opiate use disorder. We're going to be looking at depression and alcoholism. We're going to look at PTSD. We're, we have a study running in anorexia nervosa, and we actually even have a study in hmm. prodromal Alzheimer's disorder and mm. depression associated with that. And we're going to also do a post or symptomatic post-treatment Lyme disease uh, study. So we have a whole bunch of therapeutic targets that we're going after. We don't know that it's going to be effective, but we think there's a, a possibility that it will be. If it's approved for depression, then, you know, depression is comorbid with an awful lot of these disorders. Certainly in substance use disorders, things like anorexia, for instance, PTSD, it would not be uncommon to have comorbid depression. So it, it may be that with that indication, there will be applicability to these other, other conditions. Hmm. So all of that certainly deserves to be done. My, my thought about kind of strategically, uh, I mean, I think these compounds are just so interesting. Strategically, this is the right way to proceed culturally because our culture respects medical science by and large. <laughs> and we have approval mechanisms for evaluating those effects that, that are less 
sensitive to, you know, political kinds of uh, concerns. And so that seems to me a very important way to proceed. But there are many, many questions, basic scientific questions about the underlying biology of these uh, experiences, their consequences, you know, genetically and epigenetically, and whether they're predictors of these experiences, how they relate to spirituality broadly, how they relate to moral and ethical behavior. In addition to the therapeutic indications, you know, there are a range of other questions, mostly, you know, scientific, uh, you know, in terms of biological psychiatry, you know, how to factors such as personality, genetics, intention affect the likelihood of these experiences being meaningful. In terms of neuroscience, what structures and functional changes in brain can account for these effects? Are there, you know, genetic predictors? Are there epigenetic changes? And then most broadly, and as we discussed, I think these exploration of these have important implications for understanding uh, altruism and, and pro-social behavior. And most broadly and, and perhaps most aspirationally, uh, we hope that these studies will, will move understanding forward in the very nature of consciousness. So we, <laughs> we audaciously named our center a uh, center for psychedelic and consciousness research. And I got pushback from our team, <laughs> some of whom said, well, what do you mean consciousness? We don't even, that's not definable. We don't even know what that is. How can we say that? And my response was, well, you know, that's aspirational. There's something about these experiences that seem to me to shine a bright light on the nature of consciousness. And oh, yeah. I don't know yeah. how that's going to show up. Aim high. <laughs> yeah, aim, aim high. Actually, Fred Barrett from our group has just done a study, neuroimaging study on the claustrum, which has been hypothesized to be a seat of consciousness. And I won't give away any of, any of those results, but those are the kinds of questions that we should be asking. So yeah, we are aiming high. Well, listen, I'm so glad and grateful that you're doing this work, Roland. Just keep it up. And as far as any help that people can give you, I mean, I, I assume fundraising is still something you're, you're continuing to do, right? So please direct people to where they can find you. Yeah, we, we are. And if people are interested in what we have done or what we plan to do, or if they're interested in providing support for this research, they can find our our center online i think it's hopkinspsychedelic.org we have a newsletter that uh, keeps people updated and we have information about studies that we are currently enrolling for or we plan to start enrolling for nice nice well to be continued i will um i will follow your your progress with great interest and uh, i look forward to meeting you in person one of these days i'd love to do that sam so pleasant to talk to you thank you so much okay so as i said about a week after i recorded that conversation with roland i had my first psychedelic experience in probably 25 years maybe a little longer now, most of you know my history here. I wrote about it in my book, Waking Up, and the relevant chapter can be found on my podcast and in the Waking Up app under the title, Drugs and the Meaning of Life. It can also be found on my blog under that title. Now, I'll issue all the usual caveats here, briefly. Psychedelics are not for everyone. If you do them, you should do them with a guide. I don't recommend tripping at parties or concerts or out in the world where you can stumble into the lives of others or into traffic. And anyone at risk for psychosis probably shouldn't trip at all. As I wrote in Waking Up, some people can't afford to give the anchor of sanity even the slightest tug. Now, unfortunately, I don't know how one determines whether this admonition applies to oneself. But if you're concerned about this, you should talk to a psychiatrist or a psychopharmacologist or someone who can give you personal guidance. 
I really don't think people should take these drugs lightly. And as scientific research with psychedelics continues, and the opportunity to take them in a controlled setting becomes more available, I think it will become easier to evaluate these things and to explore these landscapes of mind safely. For instance, there are protocols for managing bad trips. A clinician can bring you down with Xanax or some other drug if things are really running off the rails for you. And bad trips aside, one wants to have good trips that lead to genuinely transformational insights. As Roland pointed out in this conversation, many people have good experiences that don't change their lives very much. So to get the benefit, I think you need to approach the use of these tools seriously. And hopefully free people will eventually be free to do that with all the support and guidance that science can offer. That is, if the government doesn't kick in the door and put a stop to the whole thing in the meantime. The potential of these drugs to help people is so great, even people who are otherwise well, that it would be a tragedy if we lost this moment again. So where to begin? Well, here's what I did. I took five grams of dried mushrooms and stayed blindfolded throughout the trip. I had never done this before. All my previous mushroom trips had been in nature at lower doses, and I'd never taken any psychedelic blindfolded. This was always Terence McKenna's recommendation. Five dried grams of mushrooms in the dark. And he always talked about this experience as though he were throwing down a gauntlet of sorts. He would say things like, if you really think you have an interest in the nature of mind, if you really have the courage of your convictions, well then just take five grams of mushrooms in the dark, and you'll see how much you didn't know. And I was aware that I had never done this, right? And I hadn't done it because I was scared to do it, frankly. It really was a kind of failure of nerve. I'd been hearing Terrence talk about this since the early 90s. And uh, I'd had several bad trips on LSD and even on mushrooms at lower doses that had given me cause for concern. I'd had wonderful experiences on both those compounds as well. But the possibility of losing one's mind and of not getting it back feels real after a bad trip even if it remains statistically unlikely. But after 25 years, I recognize that I'm at a different point in my life, and I had this nagging feeling that there was something for me to learn here. And it must be said that my wife, Annika, was strongly encouraging me to do this. She was really insistent that I do it. And so, as one does, I put it on the calendar. Now, as I discussed with Roland, there was one experience with psychedelics I had never had which is often reported by people who take psilocybin at higher doses, as well as DMT. And that is the encounter with something that seems to have a mind of its own. And I was interested to have that experience. And unlike the LSD experiences I remember from my youth, there was a sense of being guided deeper across this landscape of mind by something. I thought about this as the mushroom itself. Now, of course, I'd been primed to think along these lines by listening to Terence McKenna rave about these things for many years. But there's no denying that there were parts of the experience that felt like an encounter with something other than my own mind. Now, to be clear, I'm not drawing any ontological conclusions from that. I'm just reporting the character of the experience. As I said, I was blindfolded throughout the trip. So, at first, it's like being locked in a dark closet. But as I was waiting for something to happen, I began to feel that there was a jaguar in the closet with me, and I began to suspect that some accommodations would have to be made. Now, unlike the DMT report that Roland and I laughed about in this podcast, I wasn't raped by a jaguar, but I can't say we're entirely on platonic terms either. Now, psilocybin is highly visual, and the visions come in waves, and each time they receded, I found myself saying or thinking, show me more. Again, there was a sense of being led by something across an inner landscape. And the notion of visions doesn't quite capture it. The experience isn't confined to one sense domain. There's a merging of the senses in a synesthesia, 
So one is really having a vision with one's whole body. You may know the Renaissance sculpture by Bernini of the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. That captures the mood pretty well. There's just an utter surrender to this thing. It's like your mind is being extruded across a landscape and conformed to it and squeezed and evaporated. There's definitely a motif of sacrifice here and dismemberment. It's like you are the lucky human sacrifice. And to say that one's mind has simply been shot out among the stars is somehow to trivialize the experience. Again, it's not merely a matter of seeing in a vast space. It's a matter of feeling to a degree that defies description. I mean, I can dimly remember feeling such intense gratitude that I wouldn't expect to feel any other emotion for the rest of my life. And there's no question that having experience of this kind in the context of believing specific religious doctrines could seem to confirm some of those doctrines. If, for instance, I had been a Christian with some notion of the Holy Spirit rattling around in my brain, well then I would count this experience as a full collision with it and proof of its reality. But as most of you know, my day job is to not be fooled by spurious ideas passed down from our ignorant ancestors. So I'm very slow to make claims about what I think is going on here. And there's no question that areas of the brain that represent our relationship to other minds can get triggered arbitrarily, just as Roland suggested. This happens every night when we dream. We feel ourselves to be in relationship to people and things that don't exist. And frankly, the sense of otherness was actually a minor component in the end. Mainly, it was an experience of mental reality utterly beyond what I recognized to be my own mind. It was not merely impersonal in the sense that I was brought beyond any reference to my own life. There was no discernibly human aspect to parts of this landscape. Now, the first revelation is with respect to the absolute insufficiency of language to capture the experience. I mean, you are wading into a roiling ocean of meaning with the proverbial thimble. What you bring back in that thimble just can't begin to indicate the immensity of the experience, or its beauty, or its terror, depending. Even to oneself, as an aid to memory, language is next to useless. And the fact that there are landscapes of mind this vast lurking on the other side of a mushroom is simply preposterous. I mean, how could that make any sense? The scale of the thing is all wrong. It violates every intuition you have about what it is to have a mind and a body in a world. It's as though we lived in a universe where if you just reached into your right pocket with your left hand, rather than pull out your wallet, you'd pull out the Andromeda galaxy. So the experience is altogether too much. It's like a reductio ad absurdum of one's desire for experience itself. It's as though the cosmos were saying, oh, experience is what you want? You want to see and feel and think? Okay, how's this? And then what follows is a vision so blinding in its beauty and intensity that it shatters your mind. It just unmakes you. Again, I have to admit the poverty of words here. Okay, we have a word for love, for instance. But what's the word for all the love you can possibly feel, and all the love that you recognize that you have failed to feel at every moment in your life up until this moment? What do we call the experience of having that ocean of feeling invade you and fill every empty space in your mind? There really are no words to describe this experience, just as there's no way of snapping your fingers to describe it. Language is simply the wrong tool for the job. Now, how does mindfulness relate to phenomena of this kind? While both meditation and psilocybin seem to have the same effect of decreasing activity in the default mode network, this network has been widely associated with self-referential thinking. And as Roland mentioned, there was a study just published recently on the interaction between mindfulness and psilocybin. They took a group of expert meditators and put them on a silent retreat for five days and gave half the group psilocybin and the other half a placebo on day four. And 
and then they evaluated them on many measures of meditative and mystical experience, and then followed up at four months to assess the lasting effects. The important point is that on four-month follow-up, the measures of appreciation for life and self-acceptance and concern for society and planetary values, a sense of purpose, a lack of anxiety around death and dying, by all of these measures, the psilocybin group looks nothing like the controls. And compared to other studies with psilocybin, mindfulness appears to increase these effects and minimize the negative experiences. But the general picture with psilocybin, with or without mindfulness, is that, as Roland said, something like 70 to 80 percent of people who take the drug under controlled therapeutic conditions rated among the top five most important experiences of their lives, which is extraordinary. Now, I definitely think my experience in meditation helped me here, and I was conscious at many points of surrendering to the experience by cutting through the sense of self, which is to say subject-object dualism, as I discuss elsewhere in the Waking Up app. But there were also vast stretches of time where there was simply no recollection that mindfulness was an option. Again, it's hard to communicate how far gone one is. During the peak of the experience, which might last an hour or 90 minutes or so, there was no memory at all of having taken a drug. There was no reference point to my life in any sense. There was no possibility of controlling anything or of having a plan. Another analogy comes to mind here. Mindfulness seems to me like the discovery of fire, right? You can kindle it yourself, laboriously at first, but eventually you can produce it on demand, and it warms you, and you can put it to many useful purposes. And it really is fire, right? It's the real thing, as much as any other fire in the universe. But five grams of mushrooms is like being hurled into the sun. You can't use this experience at all, but it's there. It's not merely consciousness without the feeling of self. It's the utter erasure of anything recognizably human about your mind. Now, if that scares you, perhaps it should. And there definitely is a fear of death or madness to overcome here, because resistance is just futile and very painful. And there's no doubt that many religious ideas in some way relate to this domain of experience. For instance, one could say that to recoil from the beatific vision is to be cast into hell, right? Or, alternately, one could say that one gets forced out of the Garden of Eden, and thereafter there's an angel with a flaming sword at one's back, and then one is left wandering this desiccated world of egoity, filled with fear and craving and confusion. These oppositions describe a kind of geometry of mind, and the way out of hell is simply to surrender all resistance to recognize that consciousness itself, at its core, is imperturbable. Being itself is intrinsically free of its apparent changes. But it's true that realizing this, with a Category 5 hurricane of eschatology bearing down on you, is easier said than done. Now what kept me sane, again, was gratitude and dropping the self and remaining open to experience, and good intentions. Really, I think love is the ballast you want in your ship's hold as you set out over the abyss. Now, this isn't to say that the experience might not have gone some other way for me, or that it couldn't go some other way in the future, because I think there is something about the initial trajectory of the launch that seems to matter. And in this case, my mind seemed totally permeated with feelings of gratitude and love and awe as the experience was achieving its peak intensity. The return to normal waking consciousness was a little shaky. To stick with the rocket analogy, there definitely was a sense that my vehicle might break up on re-entry. The first experience that is analogous to actually slamming down into the atmosphere of Earth is the surprising recollection that you've taken a drug, right? You've forgotten that. And this entails the realization that you are someone who was so far gone on drugs that you had no memory you had taken a drug in the first place. 
and although I'm not a clinician, it seemed easy enough to diagnose myself as psychotic at that point. And then, of course, the door to unpleasant thoughts immediately opens. You had such a good life, and now you've gone and ruined your mind on drugs. How are you going to explain this to your wife, that she's now married to a madman? But again, one is bouncing off the atmosphere here. So the recollection that one has taken a drug gets forgotten and must be relearned again and again as one skids and shudders and then finally comes hammering down through the atmosphere back to Earth. Now, as good as my trip was, at moments like this, one does pray rather fervently to the god of homeostasis. Just let my brain return to its boring 20-watt glow. Right, I'll take an ordinary human mind, thank you very much. But happily, my mind reassembled itself, and there were no stray pieces I could see left on the floor anywhere. And I feel none the worse for wear. In fact, I feel saner than I felt in quite some time. My priorities are straighter. It's like something that needed stretching got a good stretch for about a million years. Again, there are people who should not take these drugs, but in the vast majority of cases, normalcy returns. Now, I will do my best to stay current with the research in this area as it continues to come in. And I really am looking forward to a time when psychedelic therapy is a legal, established clinical science. This really must happen. We need a modern, rational, ethically responsible way of reinstantiating the mysteries of Eleusis. We need to understand the furthest reaches of human well being. And many of us need to experience these states of mind directly so that we can create an ethics and a politics and a culture, generally, that has its priorities.